Hi, everyone. And welcome to this 20th webinar of the NERPS series on peace and sustainability nexus in the context of global change. Thank you for talking, taking time to join us today. I am Sharifi, professor at Hiroshima University, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. If this is uh, the first time joining our webinar, the Network for Educational Research on Peace and Sustainability, NERPS, is an international network of educators, researchers, and practitioners collaborating towards the advancement of peaceful and sustainable societies amidst global challenges. The theme of today's webinar is urbanization and urban system sustainability in the Anthropocene. And we are honored to have uh, Professor Shumei Bai from the Australian National University with us today. Some housekeeping reminders. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared through our website and social media following the event. If you have questions or comments, you can type them in the chat box or in the QA Q&A box at the bottom of the screen anytime during the webinar. Please just make sure to mention your name and affiliation when adding your comments and questions. Professor Bai will talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we will have time for discussions, questions, and answers. If you would like to ask the question yourself, please raise your hand and I will enable your microphone. Uh, now let me briefly introduce Professor Bai. Uh, distinguished Professor Shu Mei Bai joined the Fenner School of Environmental Society at ANU in 2011. Her research focuses on the science and policy of rapid urbanization and urban system sustainability, including understanding the structure, function, and processes of urban social ecological systems, the drivers and impacts of urbanization, evolution of urban systems, urban metabolism, cities and climate change, urban sustainability experiments, low carbon transition, and more recently on Anthropocene futures and urban system sustainability. She published ex extensively on these topics with many appearing in journals such as Nature, Nature Sustainability, and Science. Professor Bai is a member of the Earth Commission, leading its working group five on methods of cross-scale translation from planetary limits to local actors. She is the co-chair of the Future Earth Urban Knowledge Action Network, which was launched at the 2016 UN Habitat 3 conference in Quito. Uh, she has served as the lead author for four major global assessments. That is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, Global Energy Assessment, IP Best Global Assessment, and the IPCC AR4, AR6 uh, Working Group 3. Professor Bai uh, is a fellow acad of Academy of the Social Sciences of, in Australia since 2017 and was named as one of the world's uh, 100 most influential people in climate change policy in 2019. She is the laureate of the Volvo Environment Prize uh, 2018 and also the Global Economy Prize 2021. Thank you very much, Professor Bai, for being with us today. And we look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. So thank you so much for your kind introduction, Professor Sharif. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm really glad to visit Hiroshima, Hiroshima University, which is okay. Um, this is my first visit to Hiroshima University, and um, it's great to see some old friend and um, to visit the university. So, um, my today's topic will be urbanization and urban system sustainability in the Anthropocene. So, I think I'll talk about three things uh, today. First of all, I would like to start um, talk about urbanization. And and their impacts um, in the Anthropocene, and then um, talk briefly about the importance of systems approach in understanding um, the urban system, as well as the interlinkages within and uh, across different cities. And then I think I'll use the second half of my talk to really talk about uh, the transition and transformation, focusing on urban sustainability experimentation, and um, how we can you know, proliferate some of the good practices across different cities. So I think for this audience, this is not a news at all. Uh, we all know <clears throat> over half of our world population are living in cities. Um, and we, we all know just the world population has just passed the threshold of 8 billion a couple of weeks ago. 
So we have more than uh, 4 billion people living in cities. And by 2050, an additional 2.5 billion people will be added to all cities. Um, and 90% of this increase will be concentrated in Asia and Africa. So from the right um, bottom figure, you can see most of the addition will be happening in India, Nigeria, and China. So first of all, I think it is really important to ask why people really come into cities, right? So I think um, the real fundamental drive of this urbanization is really our people's aspiration for better life for themselves and then for, the, for their children. So in some cases, you know, they're pushed out of their rural livelihood because of natural disaster, because of war, because of, you know, many different things. But ultimately, people really try to come to cities because they see better opportunity there, they see better opportunity for themselves and for their children. So we call this really um, a process of realizing your dream, right? So in particular in China, we call this process as, you know, um, one of the biggest um, experimentation in human um, habitation history, because there are such a vast and, um, you know, large magnitude of urbanization happening in the country. It is really epitomized in, in, in the case of China. <clears throat> So what does this rapid urbanization actually mean for the global environment? I think I'll just give you one example of this impact. Um, I think by the end of 2020, there was a very interesting paper published in Nature um, where they calculated, compared the, um, the, the weight of the human-made mass with the biomass, living biomass on the earth. And then they realized 2020 is the year where the human-made mass exceed all living biomass. That's the trees, all the you know, animals, everything. And this is quite, if you think about it, it's actually quite astonishing, right? And this is another figure from that particular paper. So here you can see the total weight of animal is about four gigaton on the earth. But if you look at the total weight of plastic, it's eight gigaton, doubling you know, the total weight of the animals. And also if you look at um, the weight of buildings and infrastructure, it is 1,100 gigaton, whereas the trees and shrubs, everything together is about 900 um, gigaton. So I don't know what you think looking at this particular comparison, but to me, this really shows urbanization and urban living is actually really the, the culprit of this, because most of the buildings and infrastructure, they are really concentrated in cities. But you know, we also know that these buildings and infrastructure, they, they, they don't just become buildings and infrastructure by themselves, right? Somebody has to uh, make effort, um, bring it to the city and make it. And in those process, uh, we use lots of energy. And in that process, um, again, uh, you know, lots of GHG, uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions occur. And we all know that cities emit about 75% of all CO2 from the final energy use. And I think the recent um, IPCC R6 report actually shows about 80% of all consumption-related GHG emission can be traced back to cities. And this is just looking at sort of operational um, CO2 emission um, of cities. But if you look at the need to build and upgrade um, the urban infrastructure, in particular in the developing cities, remember we talked about 2.5 billion people will be added to cities, right? So in order to pro uh, provide the proper infrastructure to all this um, population, and then if we do that in a business as usual kind of way, then we will be emitting another 226 gigaton CO2 by 2050. And if you compare this number to, so, to the concept of carbon budget, which is you know, in order to achieve 1.5 degree by, um, you know, degree, um, not achieve, but limit global warming to 1.5 degree, then our remaining carbon budget is um, said to be around 450 or in a maximum like 800 gigaton. So if you compare this number to that number, just by building and providing infrastructure to this rapid urban, growing urban population, it will use up half to one third of the remaining um, CO2 budget. So this is really, really um, big. I mean, the, the future impact of urban um, living will be even bigger than, than now. 
And of course, urbanization and cities, they have many more um, other kind of environmental impact other than you know, GHG emission. And in this particular review paper um, we have done a couple of years ago, we really looked at to try to link the urbanization and the environment. So review some of the conceptual and empirical um, advances during the last decade. So here are some of the quick um, summary of that. So we, we identified several emerging trend and some of the important remaining questions in urban environmental research. For example, we realized that there's um, increasing evidence um, on the amplified or accelerated environmental impacts of urbanization. And there are varying distribution patterns of impacts along the geographical and other socioeconomic gradients that goes from urban to rural areas. And there's a shifting focus from understanding and quantifying the impact of urbanization, we know them pretty well by now, um, towards understanding the processes and underlying mechanisms that actually drive such, such um, process. And also there's an increasing focus um, on understanding some of the complex interactions and interlinkages among different environmental, social, economic, and cultural sort of processes around cities and then urban to rural um, interlinkages. And there are some conceptual advances that actually call for articulating and using a systems approach in cities. So I'll talk about that right after this. And in terms of governance, governing the urban environment, and there is a you know increasing focus on co-production and participatory sort of process in, in governing um, our cities. And of course, this is um, said a lot in recent years, but the implementation of this kind of process is still limited. And in some part of the world, of course, there are a lot of uh, implementation. So we would say there's a varying levels of implementation and effectiveness of, of such process. So coming to this um, systems approach, um, this paper we did um, six years ago, we defined what actually is systems approach in, in the urban um, setting and how can we actually advance such systems approach. Oh, okay, I think I took out. Um, so here we, we try to articulate, um, you know, the, the linkages within and across different sub, sub uh, system within urban system as well as urban system as well as uh, with their hinterland, how this, um, how can we adopt a kind of a holistic approach towards understand these um, different relationships? So I will try to use land use and food production as one of the examples to illustrate what this um, systems approach can actually help us to understand the urban, urban impact as well as uh, finding solutions. So this is a paper we did about 10 years ago, looking at how um, the landscape urbanization, the urbanization of the, of the land actually uh, related to the economic growth in, in China. So we used, uh, I think about 190 cities in China and tried to look at the relationships. So by using this Granger causality um, analysis, we identified there are positive feedbacks between the landscape urbanization and economic growth in China. And that is quite interesting because um, in China, you know, they, they have very limited per capita arable land. And if land is, you know, really quickly taken up by this urbanization, and this is driven again by the economic growth and with, you know, positive bidirectional feedback, then the country will be in trouble, right? Because, um, you know, the land is limited and they are trying to preserve um, the arable land. But if, and they're also trying to, you know, promote urbanization as one of the important policy to, to promote economic growth, then, you know, those two policies are really coming head to head. They are in conflict. So um, this rapid urbanization has raised lots of concern in, in the country about, um, because it affects the food security. But then in another paper we did, um, this is more recent, I think it's, it's about a year, almost two years ago. We looked at um, what is the relationship between urbanization and not land, but with the food security, um, agricultural production. And quite interestingly, actually, we found even if China actually urbanized into 70% or 80% of its population, there are ways that urbanization can actually um, not undermining the agricultural production, but actually improving the agricultural production. 
And this is because um, cities, when they expand, they, they catch most of the ice. But actually in China, the rural area, they are also rapidly sort of expanding their built up area. And this is because the rural population coming to cities, they work there, they earn money. And then because China's um, urban social policy is not really very accepting and accommodating of these new newcomers. So these newcomers, rather than trying to settle down in cities, they send money back to their countryside and then they, they build a bigger house just next to their lot. So this kind of small encroaching into the arable land actually is much bigger than those more noticeable urban expansion. It's much bigger than that. So what we are trying to say here, if we do have a coherent social policy and then the rural urban sort of policy together, and then really look at, um, you know, try to reduce that kind of um, wasteful land use in the rural area. And then if we are more accommodating in the, in the cities and people will be willing to settle down in the cities rather than having two residents between city and the rural area, then you actually can release more land than those areas, uh, land areas taken up by the cities. So by doing this, you can actually release more land than, um, you know, than, than is needed to support the, the growing urban population. But then when you talk about food crisis, land is not the only question here. So what we are, uh, this is a paper we did um, for, for Nature in 2019. In this paper, we realize if you combine different approaches, for example, land is one, but also, you know, changing your dietary um, structure, not, you know, consuming as much meat, meat probably, cutting it, in, it into half, and also reducing some of the food waste. Food waste in, you know, urban areas is huge, as many of you um, already know. So if we can curb some of those waste, actually, um, China can provide, um, can feed its growing um, urban population, even with less land, if you look at these scenarios. So this really shows, um, when you look at one problem, you shouldn't just look at um, one dimension, only land, only agricultural production, but also when you look at land, you should combine that with social policy, you should also combine that with cons consumer behavior, like how do you reduce you know, food waste. So if you do this um, combined systematic sort of approach, then actually um, many of the problems can find a, a better and more, um, how to say, more realistic kind of solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think many of these photos, uh, this is coming from the, the big flood that affected Europe last year and, and China. So these were um, previously unthinkable kind of uh, scene, I think. And you can see, um, I think the, the below two uh, photos is probably difficult for you to see, but this is flooded uh, subway train, people, you know, locked up in the train. So it's really horrifying kind of um, pictures. And above pictures, they're from Germany and um, Belgium, I think. So this sort of emerging sort of risks and vulnerability associated with climate change will be increasingly affecting our cities. And we do need to um, try to build our cities and tra transform them towards more resilient and um, sustainable sort of end. And of course, this is not just anecdotal um, flood, you know, one single event kind of um, problem. This is a figure that we took from IPCC Working Group 2 report published this year. So if you look at on the right side column, you can see um, the observed global and regional impact on human systems. Most of them are negative um, impact with very strong, medium to very strong uh, confidence level. That means we really, really understand that there will be much, much more adverse minus um, impact into our cities because of the climate change. And this is another um, example of illustrating the importance of looking at um, it from a systems perspective. This is a, a, a study we did a couple of years ago, looking at the rapid, you know, increasing heavy rainfall, which is actually causing those flood in cities. And then the level of urbanization, the change of urban land use, as well as the urban activity, which we use the urban you know, pollution as an indicator. So what these figures are showing is that there's a very strong correlation between rapid urbanization and then increased um, heavy rainfall. 
So in another word, this actually means the cities themselves actually exacerbating the risk that they are facing. So they are causing the heavy rainfall and then the flood into their cities. So again, there is this um, very strong interlinkages between different kinds of processes. So you must understand these kind of processes in order to come up with um, more um, you know, reasonable or more uh, effective policies and management um, measures. And again, climate change is not the only risk cities are facing. Um, and I think COVID-19, which has been really haunting us for the past three years, is a perfect example of that. There are emerging new, new risks that are um, facing cities. So in this paper um, we did two years ago, we looked at um, how you know, different urban systems, urban structure actually affect the um, infection rate of COVID-19. And we realized actually, I think before this paper, many people were saying, okay, this really shows the end of urban life because uh, dense urban life really means more COVID-19 you know, um, infection and things like that. But actually the evidence doesn't really show, says that. Our studies really show that instead of, um, we didn't find any strong correlation between urban density and the infection rate actually, but how the city is governed, um, what sort of policy measures you are introducing into it in managing it has a much stronger uh, impact on the um, COVID-19 infection rate. And what is more interesting for us here is that we could identify lots of uh, intercity collaborations. So when Wuhan um, started having this um, COVID-19 pandemic, many cities, including many cities in, in Japan and in Korea and around the world, the sister cities of Wuhan started to sending you know, medical supply or other you know, supplies to help city, uh, the Wuhan city. And then once the Chinese cities started to recover, they also sent back um, the, the favor to their sister cities. And although this is really a limited kind of um, anecdotal evidence, but we think this really shows the potential of intercity collaboration. And from here, we, we sort of you know, propose the idea of um, networks, networked functional resilience among different cities. Can cities actually plan um, and um, implement some of the disaster, you know, preparedness and vulnerability plans together so that when something happens, you know, different cities can help the city that are facing the risk and then, you know, vice versa. So this is something uh, we have just started to explore. So all those really points to the need of rapid and far-reaching um, transition and transformation within cities. And um, I think urban system is really identified as one of the four key um, areas that needs far-reaching transformation by IPCC 1.5 degree special report. But we all know, of course, the economic, institutional and social cultural barriers, they always, you know, very often inhibit this urban and infrastructure system transition. And it's not really easy to achieve this kind of transition. So for the next half of my talk, I will briefly talk, um, I will focus on how you can, what sort of initiatives can really bring about change in, in urban systems. So in looking at uh, the urban system um, transition and transformation, one of the concepts that we developed and use it, used heavily is urban sustainability experimentation. So by experimentation, we really mean some of the planned initiatives that embody a high level novel, you know, social technical configurations, which likely to lead to substantial sustainability gain. And I think we are all familiar, if you look at different cities, they are all doing quite interesting things. Each of them, you know, trying to figure out their ways. And I see, um, I just visited us there here, you know, Hiroshima University, you're also trying to, you know, experiment your way in smart city and things like that. So all those these kind of things are really you know bright sparks that actually um, has the potential into something big into the future and then change the the urban you know environmental interactions. And um, I believe this paper, which was published in 2010, is one of the first that really defines the what is urban sustainability experiment, and try to understand the patterns and pathways based on 30 different urban sustainability um, practices in, in Asia. So what we found in this study is that um, 
more than half of these really innovative experiments actually move on and then um, you know copied or multiplied by others so others are actually really learning from these highly successful um, urban sustainability experiments and um, I think only one case later on ended up to be really declining and not really continuing and many of them you know keep to be at least keep being an isolated experimentation and more than half are being multiplied and some even went up to uh, change the practice of upper level um, practice so then this really shows this kind of diverse urban sustainability experiments are really um, has big potential into um, into the future into um, you know turning into shifting our trajectory towards more sustainable end so we all know many cities are really experimenting and they're trying to uh, figure out their ways and they experiment uh, on a certain area and then you know at a certain period of time but some cities somehow they managed to continue to experimentation and then they somehow you know uh, succeed in making themselves in one of the front runners and I think um, you know in Japan for example Kitakyushu city is one of such example and we all know that Kitakyushu city was one of the most polluted city in the world uh, in 1950s but now today they are one of the most uh, you know acclaimed sort of um, and highly awarded city because of their environmental um, and sustainability practice. So we think it's really important to understand what makes such a city to shift from one of the most polluted city into one of the really front runners. So we looked at Kitakishu as, as an example here. So here um, we realized the importance that the existence of this succession of lead actors starting from you know, women's group, doctor, and then you know to a you know visionary mayor, and then you know the national government take up you know take it up, and then providing support. So there is the existence of this uh, multiple reinforcing loop that are nested into each other, and then in succession that keeps pushing the city towards you know more sustainable sort of end. And in here we thought it's really important to to. Um, look at how they can you know they can continue to do to do this so this is a, a concept we coined in this paper which is called positive inertia this is really uh, describing an emergent property of the city as a system where these positive approaches are embedded into the city's identity and therefore not influenced by short-term political cycle so we all know in cities you know when a new mayor come in he, he or she doesn't want to do what the previous mayor has been doing and they just want to throw it away so the continuity of this um urban policy is one of the key barrier in terms of um you know uh, shifting cities towards the most sustainable end so it is really important if this kind of uh, idea of sustainability can be embedded into the identity of cities then no matter who comes in it's very difficult for him or her to change the shift, uh, the, the, the path. So we really think forming this kind of positive inertia um, is really essential in sustaining the experimentation and innovation and continue to be a um, front runner. So now we have talked, we have talked about some of the cities are doing really well. But can this kind of policy learning that are occurring in a city be um, upscaled? Can the national government actually learn from what cities are doing? So in this paper we did a couple of years ago with my um, PhD student, we looked at the Shanghai's low carbon city uh, transition policies and the, the evolution of it. And we realized there is a structure of innovation, um, nested structure of innovation existing in, in China. For example, the Shanghai city was designated as one of the national um, sort of experimental city by the national government. And within Shanghai, there are many, many uh, different experimentation going on initiatives that Shanghai City is trying to learn from and to see which sort of um, pro, um, you know, approach is more useful for Shanghai. And this kind of learning from, you know, by the Shanghai government is actually can be absorbed by the into the national government through their different experimental cities of the program. So um, how successful this one is is um we haven't done you know an in-depth study it's, it's it's hard to identify 
but actually the existence of this such structure of nested structure of uh, innovation is actually really important um, in order to you know extract the learning from individual cases into upper level um, governance, upper level policy making. And we talked about this kind of individual urban experiment. They are small, you know, but bright sparks of um, good practices, right? But what we need is really for them to be um, multiplied, to be proliferated, and then change every, everybody else as well. So in Chinese, we say which means a small spark can actually turn into a big fire of the prairie, right? So it is the prairie big fire that is what is needed if we are trying to achieve the sustainability ability um, across the society. So we think it is really important to look at the process of how urban experiment actually work across different cities. So again, by taking um, Shanghai as a case study and then looking at their energy contract, um, the, the process of adopting energy contract system, which has been highly successful in Europe and USA into Shanghai, we try to understand what kind of process actually involved in adopting this kind of you know, uh, experiment into Shanghai. And what we found here is that um, such process of trying to learn from others is far more than simply copy and pasting. And the process also involves you know, a lot of um, reconfiguration of the actors of resources and even institutional arrangement. And if you compare this process to the original um, experimentation and innovation process, they are quite similar um, in terms of they have to restart um, and then redo their reconfiguration. And very often this uh, has to result in their own configuration, resulting configuration of actors, resources, and institutions in order to copy a successful experiment from others. So we call this um, actually contextualization of experimentation actually is a new kind of innovation process in itself. And when we talk about you know, learning from others, right? But your own city might already have your own innovative um, kind of experimentation existing in the local, uh, small scale local practices. So what happens if the local practices actually doesn't like whatever is coming in? But this um, compatibility issue has hasn't really received a lot of attention in urban sustainability literature. So recent, recently, um, my PhD student and I, we started looking at what is the relationship between this incoming successful experimentation versus the local, very small um, existing niche experimentation. So we could see through intensive you know, surveys and interviews, we could identify there are several different modes of interactions. The first one is support interaction where the local existing um, innovation or small niche practices actually are supporting whatever is coming in because they are probably complementing each other and yet they can coexist. And the second one is, yeah, complement interactions, which is, um, although probably not supporting, but they occupy different niches and they don't, you know, you know um, harming each other at least. And then third mode is the community interactions where the coming in incoming um, experimentation is in direct competition with the local existing small niche experimentations. And in those cases, there are three different um, outcomes. One is the incoming experimentation doesn't become successful. They just disappear over time. And then the local ones, um, you know, they, they sort of succeed. And then second outcome will be the coming incoming one become, you know, the dominant one, and then they eliminate all the existing small scale um, practices that are pre-existing. And then third one is that, um, you know, they are sort of competing each other and they cannot really help each other, but they, they sort of both exist within the city in a much weak, weak, weakened sort of form. So we think looking at these relationships, compatibility is actually really important when you try to learn from others. Is it really fitting with our existing niche experimentation? And is it possible to find um, you know, the, the experimentation that actually can form a supporting um, relationship between your, uh, with your existing ones? So before shifting to the next um, uh, sort of transition through cities uh, component, I would really like to emphasize 
the importance of looking into um, innovations in the global south, in the urban south. We know that this kind of um, urban, most of the urban sustainability practice or challenges are coming from global global south. We talked about, um, you know, 2.5 billion population, 90% of them will be in um, added into global south cities. So, but if you, we look at the knowledge that are uh, informing the, for example, international policy process, they are mostly coming from global north. American cities, um, you know, European cities mostly, and some Japanese cities, but you cannot really apply them readily into cities in India, you know, in, in Indonesia, for example, or in Africa. So we really think it is important to have local knowledge that are based in, you know, in those developing country cities, that our knowledge system doesn't really um, help with that. Here's one of the example. This shows, um, looks at the, the authorship of papers, top, you know, sort of uh, um, influential papers uh, from the global north and then global south. And then we look at the citations. So what this shows is that um, if the first author um, is from the south, it's quite likely that your paper is cited less than half compared to the papers that are, you know, first authored by the global north um, scientists. And also if you look at, um, you know, if, if the, if your paper is about cities in the global south, again, um, your paper is much less likely to receive citations than you know talking about cities in the in Europe or in in USA. So I'm saying this not trying to discourage you from studying global south, <laughs> but really trying to emphasize the the necessity um, to really having more scholarship in the global south. And for our you know, knowledge production system to be more inducive, to be more encouraging to, to, you know, to, to help producing the knowledge from global South cities. And I think this is one of the really critical problems in our um, knowledge production system. For example, the editorship, the reviewers, um, we do need to encourage more diversity and include more people from global South. And I always say to the um, you know, editors of the journal, you know, even if sometimes a paper coming from Global South, they look much less sophisticated with you know, imperfect language, but we really need to find a way to really support this kind of knowledge to appear so that our urban knowledge can really you know, inform our urban you know, um, policy and practice. So we talked about how cities themselves can transition towards um, sustainability and what's the role of uh, experimentation in that. But we can also um, see some of the examples where um, transition at large of the society can be, you know, can be sort of achieved through cities. So here's one of the examples we try to look at. Here's the, try to look at the role of cities in energy transition. And here um, we are looking at the, the hydrogen um, energy development in Chinese cities. We looked at um, pledges and strategies of 39 Chinese cities. Okay. So what we found here is that many cities actually, they run ahead of the national government to introduce the strategies uh, to develop the hydrogen energy. But these cities actually, they look at the opportunity of industrial development much more than environmental opportunity. So this also shows the need for the national government to develop a strong guideline so that to encourage these cities to actually produce green hydrogen rather than any hydrogen, right? If we produce, you know, uh, hydrogen from the dirty energy, then it doesn't really have as much um, positive impact. So it is really needs to be produced using the green energy. But um, uh, what we found from these 39 Chinese cities and then looking at several hundred um, policies, 122 policies is that the cities are paying much more attention into the opportunity, industrial opportunity rather than the um, environmental um, benefit of it. So here's another example I would like to briefly mention um, the Earth Commission work, which I'm um, involved in. So the Earth Commission is a group of um, 18, I think, commissioners coming from uh, 17, yeah, commissioners coming from 12 countries internationally, and then supported by about 50 young scientists. So what we are trying to do here, really trying to um, identify 
what we call Earth system boundaries, safe and just Earth system boundaries, um, and then quantify them onto the same sort of um, axis. So this is really inspired by, but really goes far beyond the planetary boundary um, framework that are also led by Johan Rockström et al. Because here, uh, we are taking the interactions between systems into account. For example, the climate and water system, they interact, climate and ecosystem, they interact, right? And then we also try to integrate people and planet. The planetary boundary only looked at the um, Earth system, sort of natural science, um, performance rather than looking at social people. But here we are also trying to look at not only safe, which is a stable planet, but just also just looking at how the resources can be distributed among you know people more um, sort of with a bit more equality, equity, I would say. Um, it's very hard to you know preach for equality, but and also here we include not only the planetary level analysis, but also regional uh, level analysis. So, um, and here we're also trying to look at uh, how do you actually translate this global planetary level thing into cities and businesses? Because unless you can really put it down to its cities and businesses, the actors, planetary boundary, boundary is just a concept and very far from our day to day decision making and actions. And I'm leading this um, working group five, which is looking at translation of this earth system boundaries into cities and businesses. And we're also investigating the levers for transformation. So how we can transform our society so that we can live within this safe and just earth system boundaries. And we have, you know, we have submitted many, um, the first batch of first phase um, outcome into many different journals. With the synthesis paper is under review at um, Nature. Um, we were in, in re revision for that. But some paper have already started to emerge. This is one of it, looking at what is the impact of meeting the minimum access um, of all people on Earth, and what's the impact of this on the critical Earth system uh, boundaries. So the background of this study is really looking at um, is really the recognition of this great acceleration of human uh, impact over the last 50 years was actually characterized by a great inequality. It's achieved through a great inequality. And we know that relatively small part of the world population claims vast majority of the Earth's resource and um, about one third um, many. I mean, up to one third cannot really claim enough to actually satisfy their basic need. So we looked at uh, what if we, you know, actually achieve this, uh, give access to all this one third um, population, what would be the additional impact? So from this figure, you can see, other than except the climate change, the CO2 uh, or GHG emission, in all other boundaries, we looked at actually very small percentage of additional uh, impact onto the earth system boundary, one to 4% of increase. Um, by one to 4% of increase, you can actually provide access to all everybody for basic you know, living. Um, and this is, I think, um, I just forgot the number, but this is equivalent to about, um, one percent, one to two, three percent of the top, um, you know, top uh, consumers. Um, well, their their impact. So we can see if we redu reduce some of the most wealthy people's um, consumption, then we can actually safely uh, meet the need of the of everyone on the earth um, for their basic and dignified dignified sort of living without um, additional impact into the pushing the boundary of earth systems. And this is um, another paper um, we did and came out in Nature a couple of months ago. Um, this is really looking at the importance of translating planetary limit uh, for cities and companies. And one of the way how, so the title here says how to stop cities and companies causing planetary harm. So what, what we found is really interest, um, important is to, you know, um, to, translate these things into cities and companies and then help them to set science-based target. 
So many cities and companies started to set um, their environmental goals, but not necessarily they're based on science. So what is important with this science-based target is that when each different cities and companies, they adopt a target, then we aggregate them all. We need to make sure, make sure that they add up, that the humanity actually stays within the safe and just boundaries. So this is why science-based target setting is really important. And these SBTs, uh, they need to be measurable, they need to be actionable, and they need to be time-bound. And uh, um, they need to be dynamic and adjusted in the face of new evidence, of, this, of scientific evidence, as well as new changing you know, social economic conditions. And they really need to be fair, uh, reflecting the degrees of responsibility and ability um, in order to reduce, reduce the impact and harm. And in this paper, we identified seven um, knowledge gaps in order to, to do that. So in the next phase of Earth, uh, Earth Commission, we will start to tackle some of the knowledge gaps. And in this same paper, we really showed that the uh, um, science-based target actually really works. So here on top, um, top row, this is um, companies with science-based target setting. Um, the N number is 659 companies. So if you look at their target, actually they are really aligning or slightly higher even um, with the 1.5 degree goal of um, IPCC. But we, if you look at companies, other companies that are also adopting target, but not really doing the science-based science target setting, their ambition is much lower compared to the science-based target setting companies. And then if you compare that with the national pledge to Paris Accord, the, these companies are still a bit higher than the national pledge. So this figure really shows the importance of mobilizing the grassroots actors like cities and companies. And once they're mobilized, you know, they can really adopt much more ambitious um, target than even their national counterpart, and then be the front runner in, in promoting sustainability um, you know, of, the, of the entire society. So I think time is up. I will stop there. Here are some of the references um, that I mentioned in, in this um, presentation. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Zai. Very insightful presentation. I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, questions and comments. So just to remind our uh, online participants, please add your questions to the Q&A box or the comments uh, box. Thank you. So uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions and comments. Good thing is that I, I have a couple of students here actually. Yeah. They're working on global south urban issues. Wonderful. <laughs> so I hope we can uh, fill some of those gaps. Yes. What is your everyone? Uh, so my name is Tapun Kumar Mandur and I'm a master student at oh. Nagar. Uh, so, thank you, Professor. I would like to. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Bai. Uh, I'd like to uh, convey my gratitude because I have been thoroughly enjoying your presentation. So, I'm from uh, Bangladesh, uh, with capital Dhaka has been the most uh, polluted air uh, once again. So. You, I have seen from your presentation that some of the cities have been uh, quite successful in uh, specifying their uh, condition regarding the uh, air pollution or even other uh, indexes. So my question is, uh, in the context of developing country uh, like Bangladesh, when there is a huge influx of population toward the city, what are the key issues of the uh, policy focus we need to emphasize to improve our condition. That's Thank you for your question. Um, I think you understand this is a huge question, right? <laughs> and uh, if I have the answer, I would, you know, I would really be really happy to share and um, that would be great. But the thing, the challenge of urban studies, is nobody has um, the real, you know, one silver, you know, silver bullet sort of answer to every question. So this is exactly why we really need more researchers like yourself to really get into the context, into the on the ground, and let's just see what works and why to learn from, you know, how, for example, Kitakishi City in Japan did it, 
and um, they might not really fit your um, particular context, but there are maybe others. So I think each city really has to find their own solutions in, in going forward. But there are some common sort of uh, ingredients. For example, you do need political will to start with. Strong political will, you really want to solve the problem. And then you also need some champions from the citizens or the business that are equally committed to try to you know, bring about change. And then I think uh, the awareness of the citizens, considering you know, this is a problem, and then we do need to push the political system to actually address it, is equally important. And the role of media, for example, you know, is, is huge again. And role of scientists in producing, you know, the, the, the evidence that can inform the, um, the policy making is also important. So none of these alone can solve the problem, but many of these can actually contribute towards uh, changing, bring about positive change. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Uh, thank you. Also, introduce this in the uh, I'm Ovin Nazmulhok and I'm doing a PhD in here. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh and graduate school of human social science, which is my affiliation in here. So uh, luckily I'm also doing the same like uh, in global south perspective and the justice justice issue of the ecosystem services in mm -hmm. global south perspective. Mm -hmm. And also I want to learn what uh, what should uh, will, uh, already applied in global north also. But uh, I have a question to you because since I'm, I also work to you know, need to focus on the justice issue in ecosystem services and on the lens of maybe in global south. So which uh, barriers can be uh, most possible problems maybe I will face to solve these issues in particular to global south? Because you already told that from global south, if we can uh, do some research, maybe some editors or some reviewers are not satisfied with this. So, what should be, um, maybe I need to focus on these issues to solve for my research. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, well, I guess, first of all, you do need to have a very uh, solid, you know, with your fit on the ground kind of research, uh, some novelty in there. And then I think whether the editors and then, you know, they, they can publish it, that's uh, in a way a next step. But first of all, if you do have some, um, you know, new knowledge that are really context-based and things like that. I, I do think there are uh, journals um, will be, you know, more apt to, to publish that kind of work. And I think the change doesn't really come, you know, overnight. It, had, it, it is a slow process, but I, luckily, um, fortunately, I think many of the top journals started to recognize the, the issue. And they tried to, you know, enhance the diversity in their editor, editorship, editorial board and diversity in reviewers uh, so that all this again you know gradually should should help but I think for a young researcher like yourself um probably the most important thing is really um really focus on the context um of whatever wherever you're working and then you know try to produce um you know really context specific context grounded I, I wouldn't say specific but really grounded kind of knowledge um, that can also be used by other similar um, context, you know, in the in the global south cities. And I think in, you know, working on these sort of issues, will have really important um, and you know bright future. I mean, publishing is is important, but that's not all, right? As a scientist, I think we, we do need to build knowledge, and sometimes even the gray gray, you know. Um, literature can provide lots of insight. So on the one hand, we should, you know, really push the uh, knowledge production system, the formal knowledge production system. But on the, one, on the other hand, it's also important to actually help the urban practice and urban policy making. So yeah, it's, I know it's, it's a big tall order to try to do both, but uh, I think that's what is needed. Thank you. So uh, we have another question here from Prince. Working on okay. urban climate action plans. Mm. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Prince Dr. Salvaje from Ghana, and I'm a PhD student of uh, IDEC. 
from as Prof said, I'm working on urban climate action plan. And uh, I'm very interested in uh, the science-based project that uh, you talked about. Uh, and I realized that from my research, I've realized that uh, not only uh, the level of DAG emissions, but uh, you also realize that even uh, for sectoral targets, mm -hmm. uh, you realize that most of them are not science-based. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are not smart, as you said, uh, because uh, for instance, if uh, in a climate action plan, and then you talk about uh, planting trees, which uh, basically uh, about nature-based solutions, which is uh, a target. Mm -hmm. And you, you just say maybe we, we want to plant trees and then you don't give the specifics, the numbers. Uh, it's, it's also not specific and then it's not time-bound, which mm -hmm. actually is not, it's not smart. So I'm very interested in that and then I would want to pursue that particular aspect uh, into detail. But I want to know uh, what usually cause uh, some of these things to happen, um, mm -hmm. where, whereby cities and companies set targets uh, which are not science-based. And then uh, what are some of the recommendations that uh, you, you will give since you've already started uh, mm -hmm. looking at those things? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um... You know, science-based or not, adopting a target by a company and cities at this stage, it's largely voluntary based. So I don't think we have a really strong regulatory and governance kind of structure can actually force them to do these things. But I think the, the growing um, social responsibility of company kind of movement and the pressure coming from um, the general society and then consumers can really force um, some of the companies in particular to towards adopting, um, you know, a uh, target to begin with, and then further adopting the science-based target setting. And there are lots of, um, I mean, even just looking at the knowledge of science-based uh, target setting for cities and companies, there are many, you know, gaps in there. Um, and at this moment, even for those who are actually doing it, they're all doing it in their own sort of way. So in, in, in the particular paper, we um, in this paper, we, you know, we identified the seven knowledge gaps and we really emphasized the need to develop a sort of coherent, um, common kind of procedure that can, can be you know, shared with others and then can be compared and can show transparently how and um, according to what kind of sharing principles your particular science-based target setting um, has, is, is, is done. Because you can, I mean, in terms of sharing these resources, there are many different principles you can share. You can say, okay, it should be per capita. Or, okay, because I have higher uh, output, I should have more. And each of these different sharing principles, they have different um, value judgment underlying this. But very often, um, these underlying judgments are not made explicit. So what we're saying is it is really ex uh, important to make those underlying value judgment explicit and then to make the procedure of um, science-based target setting uh, transparent and clear and um, that can be you know, comparable across different uh, actors. So those are some of the, I think, key first steps that we need to address. Thank you. So before closing, I just want to also take one online question. This is from Johnny Jupesta, I think you know him. Oh, yeah. And uh, his question is that uh, in order to meet this 1.5 target, of course, uh, evaluating city emissions is important. Is there any uniform method such as those developed by United Nations or IPCC to uh, measure emissions from cities? Yeah, I think there are um, there are several ways of you know accounting the um, CO two emission from cities. For example, some of the you know scope one, scope two, scope three, um, different ways of measuring different aspect of this um, you know CO two emission. And I think there are existing many um, actually uh, methods one can look up to see you know exactly which one you are trying to. Um, look at. And I think for most cities, they are they start with direct uh, scope one emission, and then they try to address that. And then, you know, gradually they, they expand that into scope two. And some of the real um, front runners, they started to consider scope three 
emissions. For example, um, the city where I'm living, Canberra, the Australian capital um, territory, they started to consider uh, scope three emissions. And I remember in 2018, in a meeting, I was mentioning, you know, Canberra is growing so fast. Why don't we really, we really need to look at scope three? But at that point, just three, four years ago, that wasn't in their um, mind at all. But from this year, um, they really realized we have to look at the scope three. And this is because we have already achieved 100% um, renewable energy supply, renewable um, electricity supply in the city. So the next step will be really, you know, expanding and then looking at how do you reduce um, scope two, scope three emission. So probably starting from scope one, but yeah, quickly <laughs> expand to the scope two and three. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I know this is an interesting topic and you might have more questions, but in the interest, interest of time, we need to close the session now. But before closing, on behalf of uh, my colleagues and nurse, I would like to once again, thank you, uh, Mr. White for the very insightful presentation and also all the attendees here and online and I would like to remind you that uh, you can visit their website at nerves.org for more information about the network and also uh, please subscribe to our newsletter you can get more uh, updates on our activities including the conference that will be organized uh, next year March 1 to 3 in Bangkok Thailand so once again thank you and I look forward to see you again uh, in our next webinars and also during the conferences. Thank you.